Good afternoon. My name is Ethan Groger with AMAC Environment and Infrastructure. Uh, we welcome you to the webinar today on the FHWA Highway Infrastructure Health Assessment Study, the bridge track of the study. Uh, I'll be your host today, and I'm joined by Thomas Everett from Phil Highway with a short introduction in just a few minutes. I'm joined also by Joe Gare, who is the principal investigator for the study with Cambridge Systematics, and Tecky, also from Cambridge Systematics, who will give us a demo of the health tool later on. At this point, uh, let me just let you know everybody is on, uh, has phones muted, and when we get to the Q&A, the operator will open up the phone lines, and I'll go into a little bit more detail in a minute, but I just wanted to let you all know that. So to start today, I'll turn it over to Tom, who'll give you just a short introduction uh, on half of Federal Highway. Jonathan, and, and thank you all for attending this webinar is to present results from an FHWA Highway Infrastructure Health Assessment Pilot Study, and specifically the results and recommendations from that, uh, res resulting from the bridge track of the study. There were a bridge, there was a bridge track and a pavements track, and tonight is going to focus on the bridge track. So a webinar on the pavement track was held a few weeks ago. The study formed in coordination with AASHTO in anticipation of what is now MAP-1, which clearly has a performance management emphasis. The study focused on determining feasibility, benefits, and pitfalls of using national bridge inventory data to determine the health of a specific corridor. During the FHWA had the input of many stakeholders, and that culminated in a national meeting held about a year ago with representatives from 33 different states, ASTO, and FHWA, where initial results were presented and feedback was provided by the participants. We invited a mix of chief engineers, bridge management staff, FHWA division office staff, to share the results uh, with an even broader audience and interact with you on, on a few different things to facilitate your understanding of, of, of what the project was and the results from it, to get back on the findings and recommendations. Again, particular focus on the benefits, any implementation challenges that you all may see, may and then most important, perhaps, any recommendations you could provide on how to address those challenges. I think it's important to say that MAP-1 requires FHWA to establish a performance measure for bridges, bridges on the national high system. And as I said earlier, this study was started in anticipation of MAP-21. So, so you don't want to get into this, that, that what's out through the rulemaking process that we have to pursue in accordance with MAP-21 will be exactly what you see here. But certainly tells you what we were thinking about and evaluating prior to MAP-21. Of FHWA, I welcome you. Hope you enjoyed today's session, and I'll turn it back over to Jonathan. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate that introduction. Um, before we forward, we'll just <clears throat> if I can get this to go forward. There we go. <coughs> Excuse me. Just go to webinar ground rules. Um, just so the session is being recorded, and as I mentioned, you're in a listen-only mode, and Q and A will will have three spots where you can ask Q and A. And what we'll do there is ask the operator to put you in a queue, and you she'll you'll hit star zero, and then she'll queue you your name, and then you can she'll put you in line to ask questions. Also, if you look at the top of your screen, um, where it has well, you're viewing Jonathan Groger's application. If you pull down, you can click on a couple buttons and hit the participants button and the Q and A button, and put your questions into that Q and A chat box. Uh, whenever you like, and, and when we get to the Q&A, we'll address your questions they also. So you can either do it live through the phone, or you can type your questions into the Q&A pod. Also, at the end of this, we'll send a, a message with the recording web address, so if you'd like to share this webinar with someone else, you can do that. Later at the end of the session, also, I'll, I'll set up a sharing pod, which will come up where you can download this presentation, the party report, and the national meeting report that we'll talk about in a few minutes. The cover today is uh, we're going to go over the project overview, basically what we, how we conducted the project and why we conducted the project and 
where do we start from? And then we'll go into the, some detail on the pilot study results for the bridge track and all the recommendations resulting from the bridge track um, part study. Then go into a demonstration of the prototype health tool that developed as part of the study. I'd like, just like to emphasize it's just a prototype. We put it together so people could sort of visualize things. Um, and to a final session on feedback, any final questions anybody has, and we'll get a few uh, takeaways from this webinar. So to get body started, get your finger going here, we're going to ask a short uh, question just to get an idea of where people are. And let me get this open. see on the poll screen there a um, question, where are you located, east of the Mississippi or west of the Mississippi? I'll give you a few seconds to uh, choose your answer and then... Neck, neck. All right, like it's closed. Well, it's changing. Okay, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and display the results. Oh, it's going to make me wait for 20 seconds. Give me one second while I close it out. Almost there. So now the poll results. And we have an almost even split, exactly what we have for the pavement track webinar that we had two weeks ago. So. Looks like we've uh, uh, half from the west and half the people from the east. So we go ahead and close that poll bar box. Um, be on the right hand side of your screen. And project overview. So it came from. Um, it was conducted by the office, FHWA Office of Asset Management, and that was improving FHWA's ability to assess highway infrastructure. Health. And two years ago, almost exactly to the day, in anticipation of this authorization having a performance management focus, as Tom mentioned earlier, it turned out 21 got passed a lot quicker than we thought it would. Um, but this stuff was put in place to, to sort of say, let's start exploring these performance measures and what we can do with both pavement and bridges. The project also didn't start from scratch. We were building off and complementing work that went by ASHTO. Some of our objectives were to define a consistent, reliable method to document infrastructure health. As we mentioned, it focused on pavements and bridges, and on the interstate highway system, to be able to expand it to the NHS also. The second objective was develop, to develop tools to provide federal highway and state DOTs ready access to key information, which, again, we'll display later on. Two tracks. The first was to develop an approach for categorizing pavement and bridges as good, fair, and poor, basically an index that can be used consistently across the country. And very important in that to be used consistently across the country is very important to this study if we're going to use it, you know, throughout the United States. Track two, we wanted to develop an approach for assessing the overall health of a multi-state corridor, and health goes beyond good, fair, or poor condition. Health could include other things, such as uh, the amount of traffic, the level of um, service that a particular roadway gives, or a whole host of other health factors. This this webinar will mainly focus on good, fair, and poor, but Sam will show you some other things that we looked at for the health reporting tool. In the project, we did it in three phases. The first was to develop the methodology for the study. How are we going to go about this? They was to conduct the pilot study, and we conducted it on a three-state corridor in South Dakota, Minnesota, and Wisconsin and on I-90. And then these three was to present findings at a national meeting, which, as Tom mentioned, was held almost exactly a year ago, ago today. Throughout the project, which wasn't conducted in a vacuum, we had a lot of input from a technical working group, and this included six DOTs. Three DOTs represented the corridor. In Minnesota, South Dakota, and Wisconsin, and then we had Washington and North Carolina on that technical working group. We also had members from AASHTO on that group. And they provided input at various 
point on the project to provide feedback to what we were doing and give us direction on the path forward and to look for from a state DOT perspective. Uh, and then we had the national meeting where this, this culminated, this project culminated. Where 33 state DOT chief executives or chief engineers or high level managers from state DOTs, NASHTO representatives, and we had federally representatives. And what we did there was present the results of the pilot study in a sea of breakout sessions of small groups of, say, 10 people, where we could discuss the issues, uh, action from folks, and we incorporate all that into the final pilot study report, that feedback. In trial one, the vision for the track was to provide or produce a consistent, reliable method that be used or nationwide. And do two things. We wanted to develop qualitative definitions for good, fair, and poor so that we could all talk the same language. What does good, good mean? What does fair mean? What does poor mean? We had discussions with the TWIG on, on what that really meant. It went boil down to a few key ideas, which I'll present in just a second. And then we want to develop quantitative measures for placing assets into the good, fair, and poor buckets. The benefits of, of doing it this way would we would alleviate some discrepancies in data and analysis. And so the approach we wanted the approach to be flexible, have it be able to evolve as measures evolve. So a little bit of testing throughout this too. We did some things that hadn't been done before to see if they would work. Some didn't. Some did. Some didn't. As well on the payment side. Um, a lot of different things. So to get everybody on the same page uh, to define good, fair, and poor, we put two parameters against it. The, the what does the condition mean? And then what kind of work is typically required for that condition? We wanted that typical work so that people could kind of see in their minds, well, okay, that's what you, you do for, say, good condition. And to summarize this table very briefly, again, as you might expect, it's free of significant defects, and it does not adversely affect performance. And work would be activities that preserve good conditions, basically bridge preservation, deck sealing, that sort of thing. Efficient uh, means there's minor deterioration on primary structural elements or isolated surface defects, or, for example, on payments, uh, functional deficiencies on the payments, no structural issues. And types of addition would require minor rehab, such as bridge crack sealing, patching of spalls, or corrosion mitigation. Or in the pavement world, it might require some thinner lays and patching. The portion, as you might expect, that's advanced deterioration and the conditions in structural capacity. And in addition, the typical work would be structural repairs, may have reconstruction or replacement. And it boils down to a simple table. It took us quite a bit of discussion to get everybody on the same page that these were the definitions for good, fair, and poor, but we feel pretty comfortable with them now. Also, to evaluation criteria to evaluate potential performance measures. And the things, the, the things that we came up with were, is there general consensus on the definition of the measure? Is there a common or centralized approach to data collection in place? And availability of consistency? data across states been established through a comparative analysis on a na nationwide basis or other research efforts. And we previous work to get to that point. And so NCHRP 2437G, which was by AASHTO, resulted in, in the Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 concept. And preservation, the work identified uh, structural deficiency as a tier measure so that people with, it can be used across the United States. Tier 1 is pretty solid. Tier 2 is, is sort of moving into a, a high level tier in that uh, some measures may not, not be quite in prime time, but they're pretty close. And Tier 3 is something that needs a lot of work to bring to prime time before we can use it on a nationwide basis. For our study, for the AWA Health Study, we set the structural adequacy based on MBI ratings is a fairly mature uh, condition scheme, and so we moved it to a tier two uh, work in our study, and we let pretty pretty heavily. Two on the health assessment, what we do is provide FHWA with a means to examine the overall health of a specific corridor, 
and re requests for information. And what what we really wanted in the end was if somebody called them up from a division office or from a state or from anywhere and said, "What's the health of I-90 through Minnesota, Wisconsin, and South Dakota?" They could have a map and they could click a corridor and they would say, "Well, you know, it has a thousand bridges and half of them are good and half of them are fit and two thirds." Let me say a third are, you know, an eighth are poor or something like that. They wanted to be able to say, uh, they asked, what's the condition of that, what's the health of that network, of that corridor? And what we do was not define health as a single health score number. After a lot of conversations with people, we was a realistic method, per se. And so we wanted to present way, the data in a way that supports professional judgment. And the best analogy we can have is that doctor on the right-hand side. When you doctor, he, you know, when you, when you, he doesn't say you're a 57 or you're a 96 or you're a 32. He says, looks at a bunch of data that he's collected on your blood and your previous, your ancestors and your relatives, and he says we're in pretty good shape, but you need to watch for your cholesterol, or you, you might want to watch your blood pressure, or you need to take this pill for that, or whatever. So he uses professional judgment to kind of give you a sense of where your health is at a particular state of state of time particular point in time concept here. We have to draw data draw our data from available resources or sources and for this we we took it from federal data data sets uh, to identify future enhancements to the data and one of the good results are just one input into the health uh, index. At this point we're at the end of our first session on a brief overview of the project. So what we're going to do is um, put it up to Q&A and see if you can uh, begin to see if anybody has any questions long, uh, over the phone. Um, I'm in the Q&A pod. So if you hit star zero, then Terry will put you in the queue. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press star then zero at this time. Take a few seconds to get everybody queued up. And if you have any questions, if you want to put them in the Q&A pod, that would be great. We can take while we're waiting for anybody who wants to ask a question over the phone. Sorry, if I, I don't see the Q&A pod. I just see a chat pod. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press star then zero. If you your name to the operator, please press star one at this time. If you go up um, where it says viewing Jonathan Groger's application, and you pull that tab down, there should be a Q&A box that you can click. Can you see that, Joe? I just have a box. Oh, you can't. You're a, a, a panelist, correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah, you won't be able to see anything. Okay. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you have given your name to the operator, please press star then and one. Okay. Well, I have a question here in the chat pod while we're waiting for anybody to come on the phone. Um, Overall health relies solely on existing bridge data already contained in the MBI. Joe, do you handle that? So the, um, the first track that we looked at on the looking at a good fair poor, fair poor is uh, based on the reflex condition of the bridges. There we looked at uh, data contained in the MBI file. When we when we get to the second part a little later, we'll go we'll show you a prototype of a, a health uh, report, and in this context, health goes beyond the condition data. And you'll see uh, again we pulled a lot of information from the MBI file, but we uh, identified some things that ever, that people thought would be useful going forward that that weren't in there. Okay, thank you, Joe. We have a session which is. Uh, which asks, is it fair to say that Federal Highway is moving to identifying bridges as good, fair, and poor? 
talk about that one? Or? Yeah, I, I, I said earlier in my opening comments, this gives you an indication of what we were thinking prior to MAP21. What, what I can't say is will that be exactly what appears in the rulemaking? This clearly gives you a good indication of what we were thinking about uh, going in uh, MAP 21. Um, question. We're curious why not use element level inspection? ASHTO and MAP 21 have moved to this more detailed inspection approach. Joe? Sure. So that, that um, we agree. And at the time well, we were doing the study, and currently today, we because we want to develop and focus an approach on that could be. Uh, apply to all 50 states today, uh, then that's why we were focused on the, the MBI data that's currently in hand. Uh, over time, as uh, the data moves to the more detailed element level data and that becomes available, then that's where that, uh, the thought is that this, this type of measure could evolve. And that's one of the benefits of having a, a good, fair, poor which as Jonathan mentioned, if we if we can nail down, the thought was if you could nail down the definition of good, fair, poor, um, over time as the data and as the performance measures evolve, uh, as an excellent example of how, uh, what that could look like, uh, then you could continually uh, use those the new data, the best available data, the best performance measures, and and uh, bridges as good, fair, and poor based on those. All right, thank you, Joe. So, anybody in queue then? We have no uh, questions. Thank you at this time. All right, thank you. We'll move on, on then. There are plenty, plenty of questions after this next session. We're getting the details. Before the next session, we'll open up another poll question. This poll is going to ask you, does your agency collect element level bridge data, which is uh, very close to the question we've had? And if does your agency use element level bridge data communicate, to communicate the condition of its bridges? And on the poll, you should be able to see it. It's open for a few seconds while people have a chance to answer. Looks like we're getting to the end here. A few people are still typing or clicking. All right. It's going to make it another 20 seconds, so just me while I'm waiting for this thing to close. Like about 20 to 50 people <coughs> uh, collect element level bridge data, and but many uh, 20 out of those 29 do not get to that to report the condition of the bridges. So that's very similar to what we found in our study in terms of um, when we did a review and so on. Joe, anything to that? No, nothing to add. All right. All right. If anything, it re reinforces my previous comment about why we focused, um, where we focused on the uh, on the MBI element uh, and the eye condition data instead. Right. What I'm going to do now is um, over to Joe. I've got to take a minute while I switch uh, screens here. Joe, have presenter rights. Then you can see my screen now? Yes. Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, my name is Jer. Uh, I'm going to walk through now, get into some of the, the details about what we did on the on the bridge side as, throughout the pilot. Jonathan mentioned we were looking at that Tier 2 measure, uh, so the, the Tier 1 structural deficiency, uh, the Tier 2 
uh, was a measure that combines the MBI condition data, and then the Tier 3 measure was uh, a combination of the, the more detailed element level data. So for the purposes of this, we wanted to uh, probably wanted to try to advance that Tier 2 bridge measure. And so we, uh, as part of the project, we selected a, a three-state core, uh, corridor. Uh, then we called the compile data. Uh, for the, for all the analysis you're, you're going to see is with the real data we had in hand. Uh, and it was all MBI data. Uh, and then we uh, looked at the data, come up, came up with different options, looked at how you, uh, they fared in terms of calculating good, fair, poor, uh, had some uh, identity issues, recommendations, et cetera. The corridor was a segment of I-90 that goes through South Dakota, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. <clears throat> and the, um, there's, about, there's about 550 bridges total on, on that corridor and 71 culverts. Uh, so uh, we had MBI data for 622 structures. Uh, all the results that you're going to see now are, are from the 2010 MBI data. Uh, that we obtained from FHWA. And you'll see in some of the in some of the next slides, we looked at different options and we compared the results between the options. And for those uh, those slides for those graphs, we pulled out the culverts from that analysis because the culverts uh, really only have one MBI condition rating. So um, all the options that we were looking at were we were looking at different. Uh, Different way to combine the the deck superstructure and substructure rating. So we looked at three options. We looked at uh, structural deficiency, uh, which again is uh, tier one. We looked, at, uh, but it doesn't. It, that one does not fit into a good, fair, poor scale because uh, it's either it's a yes or no. It's either SD or it's not. Uh, then we looked at uh, what would happen if we used the the minimum MBI condition rating, and the third option was if we did a weighted average of those condition ratings. And both of those second and um, number two and three, we could put it into a, a good, fair, poor scale. And thresholds for good, fair, poor, uh, we use the, the following for all everything that you're going to see, um, again, on, on the sub slides. Uh, if the average rating or the minimum rating was greater than or equal to seven, then it was flagged as good. A five or six is fair. A less than the five was poor. Um, that several options within the way to, within option three. Uh, so different ways, if you're going to do the average of those three ratings, uh, we looked at different ways uh, different ways to weight them. So uh, you see option three here was uh, we looked at the the health index calculation, and if you um, of those to the deck super and sub, uh, you see that the um, the deck is a small uh, cent, the weight uh, super is 64, substructure is 31. Uh, so then the option 3B, we looked at the su sufficiency rating formula, and we did the same calculation, and we came up with an even split between super and sub uh, with a little less, about 4, to the deck. And then we did option 3C, which was an equal weight, so third, a third, a third. So looking at that, we um, the variable option, and so the variable option is uh, we used uh, option three A, uh, so um, five sixty four thirty one, unless the deck on a bridge was in a very worse, uh, much more, uh, you know, much worse shape than the other two elements, then we uh, we wanted to elevate the importance of that deck. So, so if you look at the bridge health index side and you're saying, okay, well, deck is pretty low there, uh, maybe that's okay. But if the deck is really the, the weakest link on the bridge, um, then uh, we should consider increasing the weight, the, the importance of that. So, if the deck area or if the deck rating was uh, two or more condition ratings below the other ones, uh, then we used a, uh, a third, a third, a third. So, option 3D, the most complicated option, but it just it compares, uh, it combines 3A and 3C and it pivots off the, the deck rating. So what do you find? This is a, a lot of this graph. Um, this good, fair, poor graph, green, yellow, like everyone's used to seeing, for the different options. The first finding 
was that uh, and, uh, for the corridor, uh, for the pilot corridor that ran through uh, I-90 for those three states, we found a lift consistency across all the options. You see that uh, right around 40% of the bridges were in good condition, uh, regardless of what, what of those options uh, we used. And uh, about um, on the other side, uh, several of the options had 2% in poor, and then the rating uh, ended up with about 4% in poor and then uh, a bunch of yellow in the middle. So the first thing was um, consistency uh, of those options. Uh, the finding was that the, the minimum rating uh, resulted in the highest percent of poor, and, th and that's not surprising. So in the minimum rating, you look at the minim minimum, um, and then that's use that to apply, to put it into the good for poor bucket. Uh, other options and the other uh, ops rating were weighted average, so the other, uh, the other two components can, uh, tend to bring that score up. Um, but it was uh, also very consistent with the uh, structural deficiency. So that was, those things were at the, the corridor level, looking at the overall results, percent and good for poor. We also looked at the results on a bridge-by-bridge -bridge basis. And uh, we found that on a bridge-by-bridge -bridge basis, the results were also highly correlated. So in uh, in, cor in uh, co context, a correlation of one is perfect correlation. So we have here's just uh, this matrix has the options going across the top and the bottom, and you see uh, that m as in the 90s, uh, many of the correlations are in the, on the high 90s, which is means that uh, if you take a single bridge and you look at the results between these options, uh, good on one approach is going to be a good on the other. Uh, very often. The number f um, finding number four was that I, I talked about all these. Uh, we looked at different schemes for um, for weighting and assigning weights to the MBI condition ratings, and the results are not sensitive to those weights. In I, in this graph, it's the, the same matrix. I'm sorry, the matrix, same matrix you looked at before, but I've just highlighted one cell where we're comparing the results from 3A to the results to 3C. Uh, and you see uh, 3A is, gives only 1% to DEC, and 3C gives 33% of the weighting to DEC. Uh, and so despite that, that's a pretty significant change in, in how you weight those three components, uh, but we still got a 96% a correlation. So uh, not set up at all to the, uh, to the weighting scheme. So, that was, so they were, um, it got us thinking, wondering if that was just because of the, the corridor we picked. Was, um, everything was consistency. There didn't seem to be a lot of variability between the options. So uh, we, had all, we had all of the MBI data for the entire uh, U.S. So we did the same analysis for, for all bridges on the interstate system in the, in the U.S. And everything I just said before, uh, all means that I just talked about, we found to be uh, true for the entire inner system. Same graph again. You see a little bit more variability uh, than than we did before, uh, but but still very, very close. And uh, uh, the graph of the. Uh, Correlations. Um, now you'll see some of them on option option two, which was using the minimum rating. Uh, we started to see a little discrepancy. We got into the 80s in the correlation, but uh, relatively speaking, a correlation of 88 is uh, is still still very good. Uh, the, the next thing was that um, option one, which was just looked at, is, is was the bridge uh, structurally deficient. Or not, uh, those results are very consistent with option two, which was uh, looking at the the minimum rating, and uh, no surprise there, because uh, option two is essentially they're the same thing essentially. Um, if you out uh, the inventory rating and the water adequacy rating from the uh, structural deficiency calculations, um, you end up with the minimum rating, which is what we looked at for option two. And it, when you, we looked at it. Um, you know, for the state system, um, 
Uh, if you look at the structural deficient uh, bridges on the interstate system, uh, less than 1% of those bridges are being driven by the inventory or the water adequacy driven. Or, uh, less than 1% of those bridges have an SD status that's being driven by one of those. So in all, in all cases, they're being um, the, the lowest condition rating, which is effectively option two that we looked at. So that's why we those were very close. We looked at this issue of deck. Uh, there was some concern that in some cases the deck could be uh, much, uh, much worse than the, uh, the other two components. And we did not find that uh, on the interstate system. And so uh, in this, uh, for this example, the same matrix of correlations that I showed you before. Uh, now we're looking at option 3A, which weighted um, based on index, and then option 3D, which was that um, the one. Uh, and these only these the results would only differ if the deck rating was two condition ratings or more lower than the other two, and you see that happened uh, essentially at one percent of the time. So um, the raw result here is that the the, the deck ratings were not uh, the big driver here. We're, we're not pushing down the the bridge results. Uh, findings are, though, very sensitive to how to find good, fair, and poor. And I mentioned earlier, uh, the the breakdown of that, that um, we draw the line. If it was uh, greater than or equal to seven, we flagged it as as good. And so uh, here you see the the condition ratings, and you see that there is a uh, the overwhelming amount of the entire interstate system are grouped around seven, so it, it matters where you draw that line uh, and define uh, we find the boundary between good and fair. In the way of looking at that, this is the, now we're looking at the uh, this line, uh, or, sorry, on the x-axis is the combined condition rating. So we looked at option uh, option three, this is the weighted average, and, and the count, and now we red, yellow, green zones uh, in uh, or good for zones highlighted, and see uh, the the line between the the green and the yellow is seven. And if you start to move this uh, where the other, uh, then you get into pretty quickly. You start to uh, change the uh, the, the overall uh, split between good fair and poor. The <clears throat> We also saw uh, last finding. We also saw that there was a consistency um, in the MBI ratings, and and this we think um, helps to understand why we saw consistency in all the results. All right, so if if all judges in the interstate system had um, all the same rating for all of their components, then it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how you change it, uh, what the options are. If everything has the same ratings, then you're not going to see uh, a lot of variability in the results. And, and it's pretty it's a pretty good um, prediction of what we actually found. So this is this is graphs hard to read, but once you get the hang of it, it's um, pretty useful. Take take for example, uh, on x-axis we have average bridge rate, bridge rating, and then on y-axis we have the variation, um, but the uh, the ratings. And the size of the bubble is proportional to the amount of bridges. So the biggest circle that you see right here, the biggest circle, uh, means that the bridges had an average rating of 7, and there was zero variation in the ratings. So uh, an, uh, a large number of bridges on the interstate system have 7, 7, 7 for bridge superstructure and substructure. So it, it, when that's true, it doesn't matter how we combine those. We can combine them any ways. We can come up with any weighting scheme we want, and we're just going to see the same uh, results. Uh, but uh, it also, but this finding also re, uh, reinforces that idea that if you change that seven threshold uh, and, and it uh, seven five or seven point five, that threshold between good and, and fair, uh, you would have a significant um, change in the overall results.
the next bubble had a, uh, it was this one here, uh, this one, uh, and it had a, an average rating uh, about six and a half, and a variation of, uh, of a, between one and one and a half between the ratings. A very tight cluster of, uh, of ratings on any one bridge. So that, um, a couple more slides on the uh, conclusions, recommendations, and then we'll open it up for questions again. The, um, one was that we, we found nothing um, that we looked at um, uh, that the MBI data could not be used. It wasn't a valuable source uh, for national performance measurement. And I think that's not, uh, not, that wasn't much of a surprise uh, to anyone uh, because uh, MBI data, we have a long history of, of collecting that um, and using it. So we looked at, uh, in terms of that option one, the SD status, um, I guess widely understood and reported. Um, we have a history of using that too. Uh, I mentioned, though, that one of the downsides is it doesn't fit into this good, fair, poor approach. The uh, thing that we noted was that it includes some condition components. I mentioned that it also includes the inventory rating and the water adequacy rating. And so when we're thinking about good, fair, and poor just purely being on a physical condition, uh, in by went beyond that a little bit. Uh, but but uh, the final bullet uh, is, mentions that uh, even if that's the case, it's in, in very rare that those non-condition elements are driving the, uh, the SD flag. Second finding recommendation uh, was that a, the, a measure of structural adequacy based on the MBI condition ratings uh, is a viable supplement to SD status as a national measure. So the study team recommended that FHWA continue to advance uh, this type of measure. And um, implementing it, uh, it requires um, to build a broader consensus around the definition of that measure. So they get into to options um, that we looked at uh, because all of them seem to, seem to be viable options logically, uh, and results uh, also uh, alluded to that. And but there are you know very similar, um, highly correlated results. The final definition should be based on um, the answers to a, a couple key questions. So the first one is uh, the measure be based on the minimum rating or a weighted average. And if it's a weighted, if the answer to that is it should be based on a weighted average, then the next question is, uh, then what's the relative importance of DEC compared to superstructure and substructure? So what's the right way, or what's the um, what's the preferred way is a better word for it to combine uh, those three condition ratings? So uh, with that, I'm happy to, um, again, open it up to questions. Uh, you can either use uh, the Q&A box or uh, is it DAR1, Jonathan? DAR0. Zero. Zero, uh, to, uh, to speak with us. And one moment while we queue, um, the operators get their names. All right. Since we were talking about um, around the first Q&A session, uh, someone submitted a statement that said, until a level consistently implemented, element level won't work for a consistent measure. Uh, just comment from one of the participants. And we have a, another question here. There are rumblings that SD will be redefined to not include waterway adequacy. Are we also thinking about eliminating the SD category for low inventory rating? Do you want me to take that one? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> I think I have a similar answer as before. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know what rumblings means. Uh, we've talked at least for 10 years about uh, whether or not waterway adequacy should be part of structurally deficient. I honestly say that within FHWA, we're not, not we have nothing underway at the moment to look at changing the definition structurally deficient. Um, if we'll we'll work through Ashto and and look at the options to do that. But at this time, uh, we're looking to change it, even to to report away adequacy. So, the question about, about removing structural condition or structural valuation.
information is the same. We're not looking at that right now. All right. Thank you, Tom. And gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press star then zero at this time. If you give me your name to the operator, please press star then one. I would like to go to the phone line of Kevin Gaden. Please go ahead. Thank you, Kevin Gaden, South Dakota Bridge Engineer. Oh, uh, I'm not sure how many states are in the same uh, situation as South Dakota, but we collect our uh, data in element level form and then use the translator to uh, bring it back to NBI to report to the HWBA. I understand that when we do that, uh, the translator uh, had a maximum condition rating of 7. So uh, components may have been an 8 or 9. Uh, they show up as a 7 when it reported to the FHWA, and, and that may explain maybe why some of the uh, bridge out there rated 777. Uh, the new structure would be re reported that way through the translator. Good point. Thank you. Kevin, thank you very much. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press star then zero. If you have given your name to the operator, please press star one. And our next question comes from Mike Johnson. Um, the question is pertaining to the vulnerabilities that exist on bridges for Scour and Seismic. Those are not being considered here, and they seem to represent a significant portion of the thing that we use to, uh, uh, that we direct towards our bridges. Can you address that? For um, all the options uh, that I've been talking about, we were um, focused on and poor, and the conversation was to try to draw a a line on and focus um, on the the physical condition. Of the so that's why we ended up focusing on the those condition ratings, and in some cases even dropping off uh, some of the other things as you as I mentioned in, in the second option. So we wanted in the the next uh, the next segment when we uh, talk about uh, health. Uh, we are the distinction between condition and health is that condition is the the physical condition of, of the elements uh, and the components of a bridge, and then the overall health uh, is input into that is the the physical condition. Uh, but then you could pull in other uh, characteristics of a structure to get a sense of the uh, overall health of it. All right, I have a question in the Q&A pod. Um, considering the percentage of the bridge inventory being made up of culverts, why was the methodology incorporating culvert conditions not used or investigated? Um, for culverts, uh, because we're using the MBI, uh, for culverts we had a, a single data item, which was uh, the culvert condition rating. And so we, we use that, um, but in all of the options, um, because one element, then you know the, the default to there was to take that element and apply it to those thresholds. Uh, so if the if the culvert condition rating was seven or higher, it was as a as in good condition, and so forth. We uh, approach uh, accounted for that, but um, because of that uh, we took it out of all. Of of the, the comparative uh, parts that you saw, because it didn't matter w what options we were looking at for weighting the other uh, items. Um, you know, a, a culvert rate of seven is a culvert rate of a seven, no matter no matter what the weights are. Thank you, Joe. Terry, anybody else? We have no further questions. Thank you at this time. All right, thank you, Terry. Okay. Are you ready to move on? Sure. Right. I'll pass it now over to um, Hecky from Cambridge. Uh, give me a second. So we were going to do the poll, John. Oh, sorry. Can you miss the slide one? No, you still control. There we go. Yeah, okay. That my cue. All right. <laughs> a couple more questions for you, which relate directly to uh, slide 40, which Joe uh, just up. We're going to should the measure be based on the minimum mission rating or weighted average? And based on a weighted average, what should be the relative importance of deck condition compared to super and substructure? 
And so we'll poll up now. I'll give you a few minutes to fill out. Like piece of inputting, so I'll give it a, a minute or so. Just give me a couple more seconds. Looks like it slowed down a little bit, and I'm going to have to wait my. I don't know. I have to wait 20 seconds, but I do. So if you just bear with me for another second. I'll get precursor while we're waiting there. Um, it looks like most folks use a, well, now I can open it. Let me open that results. Should be now. So should the be based on minimum condition rating or weight average? 22% um, think it should be minimum. The group thinks it's rated average. So they don't really know. And we didn't get an answer from 22%. And if based on weighted average, what should be the relative importance? Um, it looks like deck weight should be lower. Uh, it gets about 50% of the vote. And deck should be equal, gets about 12%. And deck weight should be higher, gets 0%. And some people think it depends. So will you answering that poll? Let me close that now. Uh, let's turn it over to Sam. Mentioned he'll be presenting um, tool that we developed. Sam, you should have control in just a second. Hey, Jonathan, and you see the slides? Yes. Great. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Thanks, Joe. Um, very excited to be here and show you this uh, prototype health tool, uh, and Jonathan has already kind of covered this slide very effectively, um, but I will just revisit a couple of highlights. Uh, we'll show you the prototype, which is an attempt to, to in a meaningful way of assessing and visualizing uh, infrastructure health at the corridor level, um, and this is to provide FHWA with the means to examine the overall Overall health of specific corridors in response to requests for information, uh, and you touched on the uh, the sort of doctor metaphor, and that's something that you're going to see kind of running throughout this, uh, where we're not looking at a single value, a single, not a single letter grade. Rather, we're giving you um, a, a, our best take on a, a data-driven view that can really. Uh, Give one who's analyzing it a, a nice overall picture, a health of a corridor. Uh, it's drawn from available data. We'll we'll show you the data sets that we used. Um, in some cases, we identify potential future enhancements, and the fair poor results that were just uh, discussed are are a significant input into this area. Uh, so the the report the uh, the the tool we're going to show you uh, goes from kind of a simple to a complex view uh, designed to accommodate different audiences. You know, we have your kind of high-level decision makers who, who want to see everything at a glance and at a page. Um, but we also have tools that accommodate very detailed technical analysis for people who re really want to understand what's driving uh, the overall health assessment. So go from kind of simple to complex, uh, but we're going to see universally across the different uh, the different pages of the report these red, yellow, green indicators, and these are a communication tool that can help you direct your attention. You know where you see the the red is where you, you, there might be a cause for health concern, to to really keep an eye on. Uh, was in the case 
case of, of like a gain something, um, just, you know, to not uh, spend a bunch of time and concern on that area. Um, these are based on fixed thresholds, so uh, it's important to note that you might look at an entire uh, corridor that's nothing but green, and that just says that compared to the rest of the interstate system or compared to its peers, this is overall a very healthy corridor. Uh, likewise, you might see something that's essentially all in red, which to that uh, all different elements are, are, are worthy of concern. Uh, we also uh, show you red flags uh, through a port, and these are kind of a, a yes-no question, and, and where the flag is red, uh, that is indicating an area of concern. Um, again, these are based on kind of fixed thresholds, and one example is if, uh, if more than 5% of the corridor has an IRI above an extreme value. It's a pavement-specific measure, but you'll also see bridge flags raised. So with further ado, here is first uh, the front page of the infrastructure health prototype tool. Um, and I will do my best to guide you through the tool using my cursor. Uh, I'll try and speak it as well because I know that this doesn't always come across that well. But in the upper right corner, uh, you can see there are four types of reports. Uh, the dashboard Report is what we're looking at right now. Uh, you can imagine the user would also be able to select the summary or, or pavement report, and uh, we'll walk through each of these. But this really uh, follows, you know, what we call kind of the sports page analogy. Uh, you're going to see uh, some complex elements here, and they're going to get increasingly complex as we as we get to the more technical level. Uh, what we're really trying to do here is, is create something that, that's um, easy to understand at a glance uh, once you're used to working with it. We've got elements like the red, yellow, green indicators and the red flags. Um, and while the technical content behind them can be a little complex, we think once you've looked at this a few times, it, it's going to give you a real clear and meaningful understanding of corridor health at a glance. So imagine uh, you are a user who's who's been asked to look at the health of I-90 through South Dakota, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. On the upper left, this would be an opportunity for you to name your corridor. And also got some fields for a date that you've run it, and uh, you could enter your initials. Um, and what we've got here, the the largest display is a, a map based. Uh, display where you could imagine, you know, zooming in and zooming out, uh, selecting the appropriate corridor, seasons in relationship to major urban areas, state lines, you know, geographic boundaries, et cetera. Um, and you could also select what um, data you're showing on your map as an active map dis display. In this case, we're showing pavement, good, fair, poor, and this is based on real data. Following kind of down and to the left, you can see we have a, a national map to help put the core context within the U.S. and have several statistics um, give you a good understanding of of what corridor composition is. It's in this case, it's a interstate corridor. It's mostly rural, but a decent mix of urban in there. 622 bridges. That's including culverts. And but we have a uh, Land climate zone uh, VMT as well as the range of AADT. Uh, in in this notes column, we've noted the uh, data sets that are used to uh, generate this report. And this right hand column uh, really starts to get in some of the overall infrastructure health results. Determine that this this overall corridor is kind of that yellow, you know, caution but not a, a Extreme warning. Uh, the condition is quite good. Uh, we don't have a value for remaining service life. That would be one of the future enhancements that would be very valuable um, to add to this tool. Um, a series of 
red flags that, that could be raised um, given a of causes for alarm. In this case, uh, none of these are raised, but you can imagine a single red flag would tell you something. Something is concerning with the history or, or the um, the action versus the rest of the system. So uh, we started at the top with, with uh, overall infrastructure health, and then we have a, a pavement condition summary, and below that we have the bridge condition summary, which includes the percentage of bridges that fall in the good, fair, poor, uh, the breakdown of those categories, as well as bridge age. And we saw two of those two as two key drivers of overall um, infrastructure health for bridges. I'm going to now to the uh, next page, the summary page, and get a little more technical. Um, so don't be alarmed, but we'll, we'll kind of walk through this. Uh, starting at the upper middle, uh, we have a, a more detailed set of summary statistics. The value to someone who's looking a little closer at the overall health of this corridor. Bridges, we have the, the number of bridges, we have the deck area, number of structurally deficient, we, we have a load posting as well as average age, um, some other elements. In right here, you can see a pie chart that shows the distribution of the good, fair, poor breakdown. And this is organized by deck area, although you can easily look at this by number of bridges. In this case, uh, you have a, the yellow kind of caution type indicator here. Um, there are an awful lot of good bridges um, and a lot of poor bridges, but, but we'd like to see fewer in that fair column. We'd like to see more good bridges for this to really get the kind of green light, uh, not an area of concern. In if you move down, you can see the good, fair, poor uh, bridge condition history. Here we're at um, 2005 compared to 2010. Uh, and again, this has the um, yellow indicator. Um, there, there's not a lot of improvement here. Um, there's also not a ton of deterioration, which would be something that could be uh, flagged with a kind of the red sort of uh, keep an eye on this area. This core is deteriorating rapidly, at least the bridges on this corridor. Move to the left, you can see corridor bridges versus the national um, IS bridges. Uh, in this case, um, the uh, sufficiency rating and age are compared to the overall system. And with these um, box plots, higher is good. And what you can see here is that we have the range of values for the corridor, which is in red, um, and generally higher than the interstate highway system uh, overall. Move over to bridge, or sorry, to age. But you can see here that a lot of the bridges are significantly older than the system average. So this this may be something to understand when you're looking at this corridor to walk away with a more detailed understanding of, of, of where some areas of concern on this corridor. This uh, last box on the lower right is bridge ADT by mile uh, showing age. And here we've got the mile post west to east. So you follow the entire corridor here as it sits in South Dakota, goes into Minnesota, and then into Wisconsin. And this is a way to look at, at um, the age and, and um, the ADT of corridors. And this we might keep an eye peeled for very old bridges that are carrying a significant amount of ADT. And that would be something to be aware of um, when you're thinking of the overall corridor health. Uh, the thing about this um, graph that I'll mention is you can see some gray shades and those are the urban areas, uh, just to call them out. So on the left-hand side, we have a wide variety of um, pavement-related uh, records, which are very similar, almost a mirror of bridge records. And when viewed together, this is intended to give you know, a summary level, but still a, a rather technical description of uh, infrastructure health. Uh, then to the, the next level down, and here we have the um, sort of the bridge technical 
fiscal report. Uh, it has three kind of key elements. One is the condition distributions versus a comparable national average. Uh, you know, looking at deck condition ratings, what you can see here in the corridor, a red line, is uh, almost a perfect mirror image of the system as a whole when it comes to deck condition rating. Uh, there are some things that vary compared to the system, and one in particular is this uh, bridge age, where you can see um, there's a significant spike in that kind of 40 to 44-year-old bridge range. And that's something to be aware of that, again, the, the bridges on this corridor are a little bit older than the system in general, um, and that's something to, to note. Uh, you can see here we have the, the data in A under the expenditures. This would be something where better data might uh, support a health assessment if you were to have detailed data on the cost of projects in this corridor or the anticipated costs of replacement for bridges, you know, be something to factor in and identify, you know, potential areas that are going to be significantly more expensive than others or significantly less expensive. Um, and that obviously is a factor when you're thinking about health and how to improve health. Right, we have the uh, bridges with lowest, lowest average condition rating. Um, this is a table calling out the worst offenders, um, structure number, as well as location. Um, this uh, lower right, we have our red flags box. And in this case, none of the flags are raised, but you can imagine that if these were raised, there would be a, a concise statement, you know, telling you that this corridor does show a significant decline in bridge condition versus five years ago or another flaggable feature of the corridor. See the, the last page, uh, which is the pavement page. Again, we have the pavement distributions versus the comparable national averages. Uh, a, a table that highlights the segments with the worst pavement condition as measured by IRI. We have uh, the red flags. So the idea here is that is that taken in full, uh, the dashboard, the summary, and the technical pages for bridge and pavement, um, that a, a viewer here can have a good understanding of corridor health uh, based on the, the best available data uh, presented at a summary level that might be suitable for you know decision makers, legislators, people who don't have a significant amount of time for it or interest in the technical area. But this also uh, provides technical analysts with the ability to dig and learn a lot more about corridor infrastructure health. So that kind of concludes the presentation of the uh, prototype health tool. Uh, and I will open it up for questions for myself or any, any of the, the team on the phone. Terry, can you uh, start taking questions? And I believe the guidance is star zero. And we have a follow-up question from the line of Kevin Gate, and please go ahead. Kevin? One moment. His line has to be released. Hi, your line is open. Please continue. Uh, yeah, this is Kevin Gaden again. I guess I just want to reiterate the uh, the data from the NBI uh, database there may be a little bit skewed if, if there's other states that are using uh, the BI translator. Um, it's a part of the reason why uh, there's more yellow than green on the pie chart on the bridge side it could be uh, due to that maximum seven condition rating for deck super sub. I, how do you want to address that, or how would, would you a proposed address that. Joe, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. I think um, it's it's one of the things. It was not addressed. Um, the I translator 
uh, Kevin will not address in, in this study, uh, but it's one of the things that should be flagged uh, for going forward uh, as FHWA continues to, um, to look to these options. Maybe we could pull uh, those online to see who uh, may use it in the same type of a, a system for reporting that we are, you know, going from an element level to NBA by translator. Okay, well, I think I might be able to do that. Um, and while doing that, uh, I'll jump in. This is Tom from Federal Highways. The uh, last data I have indicates there are only three states that use the translator for converting the data. Okay. And and in the Carter study, I don't believe Minnesota or Wisconsin um, are users. Okay. Well, the data from South Dakota might be the only part that might be skewed a little bit. Correct. I should be able to pull up in just a second. Okay. I see a question now. How many use the translator? I was talking quickly, so. Responding, it's it's specific. How many use it to produce the MBI numbers that are reported to us? Right, good point. Right. Yeah. like it's bring down. Let me see if I can display the results. So many uh, use the translator. So um, as Tom just perhaps it's not as prevalent, but it, with Joe, I mean, I think that needs to be looked at a little bit as it expands to a, if it expands to a nationwide type type of thing. Good point. With another question, um, let me just get this out. It's used at a single state level or partial corridor. The is designed, um, yeah, it could be used um, at either of those levels. Um, it was designed with the multi-state corridor in mind. Um, a lot of kind of way that we're displaying data uh, is optimized for those conditions. But there's nothing to prevent um, looking at uh, interstate corridors within a state or looking at a partial corridor um, at all. So it could be used for either of those. The design of the tool very much focused on interstate data. There would be additional challenges if you're looking at the NHS as a whole. Um, good question. And add to that, I mean, I've, I've heard rumor that Federal Highway is not, I've heard things, that Highway is developing a tool like this for at least for HPMS data for pavements. So uh, it could be that at some point in the future this could be part of the the NBI. Another question here. Would the expenditures being reported be a combination of federal and state? Uh, I, I think uh, that the answer to that would likely be yes. Um, you know, it, 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 we're, we would less be looking at expenditures from like a policy um, assessment standpoint. It'd be more um, understanding whether the costs of repair and rehabilitation within this corridor are in some ways out of whack with, uh, with the national averages, because that would be an indicator, you know, of, of particularly difficult conditions on the ground or something that, um, you know, should be paid attention to. So I would imagine that, you know, overall expenditures would be looked at, and that would be a blend of, of state and national cost. Thing to add to that? Yeah, no, that's right. If you take the extreme case of which you would look at this corridor, and if you can, if we had expenditure data for for all the uh, nationwide, for all the bridges, if it jumped out that, that you know this corridor looks like it's in pretty decent shape, uh, but 
the amount of money that's being spent and the amount of money that's been spent on that corridor over the past five or ten years or whatever is really high compared to national average, then again, that's just some. It's just one piece of information that goes into trying to, uh, you know, not on that corridor, the um, or not a computer trying to figure out what what the overall health of that uh, structures are. Uh, it would be another piece of uh, data people flagged as being potential very useful for this type of assessment. Gary, do anybody else on the line? Yes, we do have a question from the phone line. Mr. Mike Johnson, please go ahead. Mr. Johnson, your line is open. This is Mountain. I don't believe I asked a question uh, other than the previous one about uh, risks and vulnerability on bridges. I guess I would reiterate that if 21 is moving to risk-based performance measurement, um, I don't see any risk in in these uh, dashboards here. So we'd, I'd like to see or understand how does risk vulnerability, seismic vulnerability, or others fit into this framework. Again, that represents a significant amount of our expenditures. Yeah, it, it, it's a, a good. I'm glad you brought it up again because it's a good point. And the w one of the things that we were, I mentioned that it, it could be a, attached to the, these um, to this type of um, port or, or display. And one of the things that we were talking about, there was a lot of discussion when we were doing this about. You know, everything you see here now it revolves around the condition and the age and traffic volumes, uh, weather, uh, et cetera. And one of the things we were talking about was uh, the ability to, if you had this type of foundation for the report, you could start to add on additional factors. So uh, looking at the corridor, uh, a corridor, you know, in addition to pavement health and bridge health, for example, you could look at uh, congestion levels, the levels of service, the, um, the safety data, uh, where there are hot spots, and you could start to to add uh, layers uh, of this uh, of this assessment. And now, as you're describing it again, I think that th this is, is something that could lend itself um, really nicely to to that vulnerability layer, um, as you mentioned, that it required. Um, you know, Minap 21 uh, at the time, uh, it, it wasn't. Because um, this work, work uh, pre uh, map 21, but I think uh, you're exactly right. There are some data out there uh, that lend itself well to that type of analysis, and, and this type of tool or platform for uh, adding that on uh, makes sense to me too. And we have a question from the line of Rich Moroni. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess the the goal of the study here was to give FHW a a, a means of answering questions at the corridor level and it seems like it, it does a pretty good job at that but you know at the state level for the bridge managers um, it, it, it's helpful I guess we spend most of our time with our poor bridges and it really doesn't give much information on the poor level of bridges it does give a over and may warn you that um, you know, groups of bridges are going to um, attention soon, but it really doesn't go deep enough to help bridge managers out, I don't think, you know, and uh, I'm not how how we'd use it. I'm sure it might be helpful to FHWA. Yeah, and that's a good distinction because um, the thinking there was that this wasn't meant to be a bridge level management tool, uh, you hit it on the head. Um, the, the vision of this was uh, trying to get a sense of of a particular corridor, and in the most extreme case, a particular corridor that crosses multiple states. You know, look at I-65 across the U.S. or I-95 or whatever the case is, uh, and try to look at those uh, data at the corridor level to try to get a sense of the overall uh, health uh, of that corridor relative to um, um and bridges in the U.S. So it's a distinction. Thank you for for making that. No? And we have no further questions. Thank you at this time. Right, we have one more in the Q&A pod. 
um, does appear a substructure weighting greater than 33% was investigated. Logic, it would seem poor substructures would be more critical than poor decks or superstructures. Uh, so the uh, correct. So what we looked at the of the three uh, or of the four weighted or weighting schemes that we looked at. Uh, Option with the highest substructure rating was 48%, uh, which was based on the uh, the sufficiency rating. So, um, question: We did not look at increasing uh, the up. Um, the is just based on um, everything else um, that we found in terms of the the lack of the the variability between. Um, and the weight weighting um, sensitive weight so far uh, that we wouldn't see uh, a significant shift. That, that my that would be my assumption, but I think uh, it would require a little bit of uh, more analysis to figure out uh, if that's or not, and to understand why or why it isn't. Um, and, and I think that's uh, that's the type of thing uh, where uh, I mentioned to, for this type of measure to go forward, there's some more work to be done to um, to build consensus around what that actual final uh, weighting system would look like. Um, and so this is that would be a great thing to flag uh, as part of that discussion. Thank you, Joe. Uh, maybe two or three more minutes. If anybody wants to, if, if we said you can ask questions over the phone line. If you want to call in and make a comment, that's great too. Um, and as we kind of wrap up, if anybody has any comments, wants to call in here, you, you just let me know, and we can jump into this. But I don't have more questions in the in the question pod, so we'll just move on. So. Last slide here. Um, for more information, the FHWA Office of Asset Management, where of course Tophis can answer any questions that you have. Um, in order to get these publications, in a minute, as soon as I turn off sharing this PowerPoint, I'm going to turn on sharing uh, a file, and you'll be able to download the free file I mentioned before. This presentation, the pilot study report, the national meeting report. You can go online. When you exit out of this webinar, the management website will pop up and you can explore there if you want to look around for other documents related to this pilot study. And also, as I kind of alluded to and Sam mentioned, the Office of Asset Management and perhaps our offices in Federal Highway are following up with new studies focused on resolving some of the issues that we presented. And this applies more to the payment side because there, we found a lot of issues there. So, so um, But as I mentioned, on the bridge side or at the higher level side, they're looking at creating a health tool not like this, but similar to what we presented here. I mentioned, as long as the technology gods work out, we'll be sending an email in a, at about o'clock with a link to the webinar. You should be able to download that or view that at your leisure or share it with anybody that you'd like to share it with. So, Terry, we don't have any questions or further comments on, on the line? We have no questions or comments at this time. All right. So, I guess, uh, unless anybody has anything else to add, we will thank you for participating today. It looks like almost everybody stayed for the whole webinar. We appreciate that. As I mentioned, I'll stop sharing this presentation right now, and I'll share the um, transfer box. Let me just bring that up. Let's see if I can do that. Yeah, see on your screen a file transfer box. You can click on any of those files and, and download them. Those, those number of bytes look pretty big, but it's uh, a couple of megabytes. It doesn't take very long to download. Um, and with that, we'll leave the screen up for, say, 10 minutes. We'll thank you and uh, appreciate your time. And ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude our conference for today. I want to thank you for your participation in using the AT&T Executive Teleconference Service. You may now disconnect.